Hey guys, Captain Zach here, up in Juneau, Alaska. Um, before I hit the water this morning and uh, start chasing some halibut, I thought I'd take a couple of minutes and, and give you a walkthrough of this boat. I get a lot of questions about some of the specific features uh, of the boat. Um, it's a 2019 Hughescraft Sea Runner 21 foot extended transom. So I thought I would just put together this, uh, this review. I'm going to aim to be as comprehensive as possible because I know, you know buying a boat is a, uh, is a big investment. I know it certainly was for me, so I was looking around at a lot of sources, trying to do all the research I could, and I found similar boat reviews helpful. So hopefully this will sort of pay it forward. I will be um, as detailed as possible, let you know some of the considerations that was going through my mind uh, when I was taking decisions on this feature or that feature. And hopefully it'll help inform uh, you if you're looking at you know similar boats or just trying to think about you know what kind of watercraft you might want to be on some somewhere down down the line. So so anyway, uh, there will be some different segments here. I'll kind of walk you through through the boat, the experience, etc. But hopefully you'll find this helpful. So I'll I'll start with the buying experience, which um, which was actually fairly smooth. I uh, I live out of state, so I live on the east coast in the winter. Um, so it was a real decision to figure out kind of where to buy this this boat from. You know, I was I was thinking about you know what dealers do a high volume of Hughes crafts. Uh, so you know, not just are they experienced selling them, but but are they experienced rigging them? Are they is, is this thing going to get rigged correctly at high quality so that so that once it does get up here to Juno, I'll really be set up for success. Um, so I just did a, 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 some research on who's doing volume of these boats and, and you know who's having some happy customers and. Uh, I landed on Tom and Jerry's Boat Center over in Washington, um, and I, I had a, just a great experience with them. So we spent spent a couple of months uh, just sort of back and forth on some different options, so traded a lot of emails, uh, some detailed phone calls, talking about all the different considerations, um, you know, engine size, downriggers, things like that. Uh, and then once we finalized that, then they sort of started rigging the boat. I flew out and actually saw the boat just, you know, starting to get rigged. Got a sense of uh, exactly what we were what we were landed on, uh, and then a little bit a little bit later, I, I actually flew out once again and and took the boat on a on a test drive. So just to get get it on the water and, and kind of know that that was definitely the right one for us, uh, and and then that was sort of it. It was really smooth. In fact, the uh, Tom and Jerry's they they actually took it over to the ferry for us, and we ferried it up here up here to Juno. So. Um, all things considered, being being remote uh, and trying to buy a boat and then get that boat all the way up to Alaska, it was actually a really really smooth process, and I have a you know a really really fond experience with uh, with Tom and Jerry's. I'd, I'd highly recommend them. So one never ending debate with boats is what engine to put on it, what engine size. Uh, boats are rated for a range of engine sizes. So this particular boat is rated up to a two twenty five. Um, you know. A lot of folks end up with putting a 150 on this boat, and they they like it. Um, some folks go for a 200. Uh, this one's rated up to a 225, and I actually chose to max it out at 225. I have a 225 uh, Honda for the main motor, and then a, a 99 Honda Kicker for for trolling. And uh, you know, after a whole season of, of running this, I, I couldn't be happier. I, I think that was for me the the perfect choice. You know, as I was thinking about this, it was really, uh, the considerations were twofold. Uh, you know, safety and convenience. So first and foremost was safety. I wanted to have a little bit of extra uh, power, some get up and go. Uh, you know, if storms are rolling in up here in Southeast Alaska, sometimes the weather changes quickly. I wanted to be able to get off the water if I needed to, or dart out to a cove if I needed to kind of hunker down. Uh, if I get caught up in some, you know, four to six footers that I'm not, not a fan of, you need to have that extra little power to be able to punch through those. So ultimately safety was the number one consideration, uh, which is why I ended on that uh, 225. Uh, convenience though does matter. I mean, it, it is nice to be able to punch it up. Um, I, this, this engine at uh, 4,600 RPMs, you know, it will run probably 30, 31 miles an hour. I'm getting about um, 3.2 miles per gallon. So that's a just a super comfortable cruising speed. You can cover a lot of ground that way. Um, not burn too much gas, so it's just a it's a really nice fuel efficient setup. Uh, I will say though that if you need to punch it, you know this boat will run sort of in the low 40s comfortably as well with that 225 on there, which 
Um, you don't you don't always need to run that way, and it's going to burn up a little more fuel. But but it is nice if you need to cover some ground for for whatever reason. You're anxious to get on the halibut, or or you have some kind of a you know medical emergency or whatever. To give yourself that flexibility is is really key. Um, and then that nine nine kicker for for trolling uh, for salmon. Uh, that's been just you know super reliable. Just you know really really works out nice. Um, and uh, some back trolling as well. So if you're back trolling for halibut, it's really nice to have that, you know, 225 main sitting in there. It serves as a nice rudder, and then and then you have that 99 kicker to be able to kind of propel and, and steer. So so far, uh, like I said, I, if I had to to choose those engines again, I would make the exact same choice. So in, you know, in terms of the electronics, I went with a Garmin suite of products, if you will. So so I've got a big big chart plotter over here. Um, at, at sort of the main helm. You know, this is the GPS and sonar, a really powerful unit. There's a similar unit that's a little bit smaller, uh, but it runs off the same setup right above the rear helm, so the rear steering wheel, which is really helpful if we're doing some trolling for salmon to be able to quickly take a look at the contour of the bottom, the depth, see if there's a bait ball out there. Um, you know, these units have performed really well. Uh, it's the, transducer works great we get a signal um, even at a, at a at a medium speed so um, never have a challenge on identifying the you know the bottom and uh, the level of precision has actually been kind of impressive sometimes when we're uh, trolling you know you see the kind of the big spikes where you know that's some salmon swimming through uh, even when we're out whale watching we're seeing these giant bait balls and sometimes you'll see even the big spike of a you know, a humpback down there. So I, I have been thoroughly impressed by, uh, you know, by these, these Garmin units. We also chose to put a, a Garmin radar on the boat. Um, again, just kind of a safety precaution. So we don't typically navigate at night, but, but up here in Alaska, you know, storms can roll through uh, all of a sudden, and especially fog. Sometimes you can be, it can be a perfectly sunny day and you'll then you'll get this huge wave of fog coming in. So so the radar is a really uh, useful tool. You know, last year, uh, again, this boat's a year old. Last year, we spun that radar up, you know, maybe four to six times. So we don't use it every day, but, uh, but when we do, it's really important. You know, when you're stuck in some thick fog, uh, you can't be guessing at it. There's a lot of other, you know, b boats on the water, and it's just really important to really understand, you know, what's around you as you're trying to navigate back to safety. One other Garmin uh, unit we put in is just a, a VHF, so a standard marine radio right here, which again is just kind of table stakes for um, you know for boat safety. So really, really important. So one thing I found really impressive is is just how much space this cabin has. Uh, there's a, a lot of storage, which really helps kind of get all of your gear out of the way, so that you end up having a lot of a lot of space for just passengers and also able to kind of move move around. So I'll give you a sense of some of the different sort of storage uh, features that we found really useful and then also show you just how the uh, how the seats lay out, how the bed lays out, etc. So there's tons of storage uh, right under the bow. So you have three different three different access points and I've, I've sort of opened them here so hopefully you can see right under the uh, sort of the captain's helm there in the center and then the and then the passenger one as well you can just open those up and there's just just tons of storage under there i mean we've got like extra anchor and and our uh and our hose in there but but you can basically stuff that to the gills we don't really even need it at this point because we've got so much storage in other places as well but um tons right under the bow for sure yeah you've got all kinds of rail storage as well so I'll just do kind of a quick pan. On the top, you've got these double double rails. So, you know, there's like a, a top section and one right under it. So there's just lots of, lots of space to store things like rope, fishing rods, um, just kind of whatever, whatever else you want, knives, pliers, just some of those basics. That rail c continues all the way up over the top. Again, more storage. We just throw some like rags up there. Um, and then, you know, things like a knife sharpener, some salt for ha brining herring, things like bags, paper towels, that type of thing. But a lot of, a lot of storage here. These are fairly deep. The one, uh, one improvement we're gonna do this year 
is actually put some of this material. So that material that goes like at the bottom of bottom of a drawer, the soft material, we're going to add that to the bottom of the rails so that there's no uh, clanking. As you can see, those rails do extend uh, on the bottom as well. So on each each side, you've got these rails. So you've got some downrigger balls there. That's what does some. That's the culprit for some clanking. So that we're going to put that that soft material there um, just to pad it up. These rails do run all the way behind the seats, which are which are super nice. I mean, there's just there's a ton ton of space there. I'll come over and kind of show you this side as well. Uh, same thing. That rail there again. It goes all the way back behind the seat. So you can imagine that just runs the whole way there, sort of an endless amount of options in terms of what, what you could put, could put there. And on the, the passenger side, of course, there's a glove box with ample storage as well. We often just put the electronics covers in there and then some of the manuals and other sort of important papers. You can see the seats have sort of elastic mesh uh, storage as well. Um, we don't we don't overuse these because we don't want them to get worn out. Sometimes like a like a water bottle holder on a backpack can get a little bit worn if you keep putting a water bottle in it. But um, but we do store some small things such as there's the uh, you know the crab measure. Um, again, these are folded down. So when this is folded up, you can see it's just a nice way to get get some small items uh, out of the way. So apologies for any shadows. We now have one of those rare uh, sunny Alaskan days. Um, the the passenger sort of side seats here have uh, just a ton of storage under them, and then um, and then also they fold out to to a bed. I will say that um, that the one on the uh, on the port side here has a little bit easier access. You can see how there's like a little gap there that allows you to sort of reach in and get your gear, whereas uh, whereas the one on the starboard side does not have that little gap. So we tend to put things like, uh, you know, life jackets, throw cushions, etc. Um, on the starboard side where, where we're not going to have to access it as much. And then things like the fishing tackle um, that, that we are going to need uh, more frequently or like a light rain jacket that we might be grabbing every so often, you know, we'll, we'll toss that in here given that these sort of lift up just a little bit. Um, that might be one one challenge is uh, is sort of getting to the to the bottom of these. If you want to take that cushion off, if you want to take this cushion off, you do have to uh, remove the back cushion. So that you know that that that's maybe a minor um, a minor challenge. It just takes a little bit little bit of extra time. Uh, I find that most of the time, the gear that I need uh, most often, I'm able to just actually access. It, with the combination of just lifting this up a little bit because it's, it's lifted as high as it can go right there without removing the back cushion uh, and then this extra sort of gap and, and window here you're able to just reach in and, and grab what you need. Now I've taken that back cushion off by just sort of sliding it up and you'll see that this opens fully for access to the gear. So now this is the uh, starboard side seat. You see I removed the back cushion. And as we lift this up, you'll notice these two bars there, uh, right on the bottom of the cushion. These bars are actually the ones that will uh, will go across both seats to, to help form the bed. So I'll actually throw the bed up just to give you a sense of that size and the process. And as you can see, as I mentioned earlier, some of the you know things that um, storage items that we just don't don't often use because there's just it's a little harder to access because you have to take the back off to to get to these. So now you'll see I've uh, I've laid those bars right across the seats. There's little fittings where they they just slot right in. And now what I'll do is I'll take these uh, seat cushions, so the backs. And then I'll just lay them right across, which that'll that'll form the uh, the bed. So there we go. The uh, the middle cushions are in place, and I uh, took off my extra tough boots just so that I could fully sprawl out. So I am I am five ten, um, and I can lay out perfectly here and not touch either side of the boat. 
Um, my wife and I often, you know, spend a weekend out on the boat. We'll spend like overnights out here. Uh, and it works out just fine. There's plenty of space here. You see, able to fully, fully lounge out. Hey, one other feature worth mentioning. We did choose to upgrade to these uh, smooth move seats. So the sort of the upgraded seats, they're like air ride seats. So when you hit a wave, it just kind of bounces really slowly and helps absorb the shock. Uh, that that does make for a really smooth ride, uh, especially if, if you're in, in the type of chop where you're just kind of bouncing against wave after wave after wave. It really does make a nice smooth ride. Uh, those seats rotate all around and they can also go sort of forward and back. Uh, and there's another nice set of storage under, under each seat as well. Maybe another item I'll mention on the uh, port side in the cabin here uh, are these privacy screens. So... I have them folded up now, but this comes across this way. This unsnaps and comes all the way across. And then this actually, this will unsnap right here. And come all the way out and around. Now, the, uh, that creates a bathroom. If uh, if so inclined, you can use a, uh, a portable portable toilet. They make a couple of different types. Some that are just more like a folding chair. Others that are sort of a bucket, top of a bucket, and then some um, magic that goes within. Uh, and this creates a little a little space, a little privacy tent um, if if needed. Um, but even if even when you're if you don't want that whole tent. We actually find that if you're uh, if you're sleeping on the boat, it is kind of nice to to toss this up. Um, and then also, it, it, it's a nice security feature at the dock. So when we when we dock our boat, we can dock it um, dock it port side, and then we actually put those up. So if we have some gear, like if we're laying rods down here, um, then nobody can actually you know look in and see. So it's a nice security feature as well. And please excuse the float plane. We get a lot of those up here in Juneau. Hey, one feature that, that I found particularly helpful, you know, especially if you're taking this 21-foot boat and trying to push it into some heavier seas, are all the handrails within the cabin. I mean, this cabin can be remarkably peaceful, uh, even if it's a little bit hairy outside. And so to always have, like, a really sturdy... Uh, grip is is useful um, anytime you need you need steadied. So, you know, here we are at the at the captain's chair. There's a nice handrail there, uh, one right here, and then right above the the port side uh, seat, right there. You've got another one right here, another one over here on the starboard side, and then again above the. Um, the starboard side seat. So, so really, no matter what uh, position you are in this mid-length cabin, you're always going to have a really sort of sturdy grip if 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 you need it. Whether you're in high seas or whether you're just trying to, you know, crawl over any kind of gear that's laying on the ground, um, it it does really make a make a big difference. It's a nice 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 safety feature. Hey, one other nice feature here are these uh, these sliding windows. So you see, we can. Sort of slide the window back. We've got these on the uh, on the port and starboard sides. But then we also have screens, so you can pull that forward, which is really nice. If there are any like bugs in the area, you can you can still get some some fresh air in the cabin and not have to worry about those mosquitoes coming in. See, this slides all the way back, and the, uh, the same over here. Yeah, so here's the view from the captain's chair. Uh, just a super comfortable, comfortable helm. Uh, you can see the, the throttle there, the shifter. There's the main chart plotter. Radio, little cup holder. I like to have some coffee in the morning. There's the radio receiver. There's the trim tabs. Those can be really, really useful. Uh, especially if there's some, you know, you're facing some chop or you're getting kind of some side, side waves that you need to navigate through to keep the boat 
uh, running running flat to keep the the bow from from jumping all over, uh, and all the of course all the different accessories here, uh, like a bilge or or the courtesy lights. Hey hey, two quick features I'd like to point out about this chart plotter that are just so useful and really just above and beyond the traditional functionality of a chart plotter. I could do a whole review on this alone, but I'll, just the two ones I'll mention quickly here. Um, one is auto guidance. So essentially, if you just set any uh, any point you're trying to navigate to, this will calculate the optimal path for you and show <clears throat> a shaded line. So I've done this just for simplicity, um, a place that's just a half mile away, which might seem kind of remedial. But, but if you're going somewhere that's you know, a hundred miles away, and you are interested in understanding what the most efficient and what the safest route is, uh, this can be really useful. It can help you navigate um, always in safe waters and help you avoid some pitfalls, things like, like rocks and, and reefs that you might not uh, be able to see um, based on the tide cycle. So that can be really useful. Uh, the other one is that this is, um, is connected to the engine. So this has all the engine an analytics on it. Uh, and also the fuel analytics. So, you know, I can just switch over here to fuel. This digital fuel gauge is uh, so helpful. Um, fuel gauges are always a challenge in um, in boats as you're going through rocky seas trying to get a, you know, kind of a, a gravity-driven view of what the fuel is. So the fact that the engine um, knows how much fuel it burns and this knows how much gas you have in the boat, uh, it can do the math and let you know exactly um, how many of your, your gallons are left. And this has a 90 gallon tank. So uh, this is just a super useful tool to be able to quickly understand exactly how much fuel you have on board, not guessing at it. And when I mentioned before that I get about 3.2 miles per gallon running it at about 4,600 RPM, which, which has about, you know, has us in the low 30s, about 30, 31 miles an hour. Uh, this is how I calculate that. So the, it, it pretty much just tells me exactly based on my current run speed, you know, what my mile per gallon is, how many, what my range would be at that, at that current course. Um, just a lot of, a lot of powerful safety features here to, to make sure you don't get, get stuck without fuel. So now we'll call it to the bow. Oh, there's not a, not a ton to talk about up here, but, but I do want to point out that the uh, the anchor box here. So as we come up, you see our our anchor ball. We use an anchor ball, uh, a float system, which actually I have a another video describing how to use that effectively. Um, but it is spacious. I mean, you can fish you can fish people from up here, uh, especially on a calm day. If it's real choppy out, this could be more like a roller coaster up here. But um, but there's definitely um, some nice space here. <clears throat> you could even throw kind of a rod holder on. On this rail uh, or that rail, you know, being able to fish to two up rods, depending on the local regulations and how many folks are in your boat, uh, that can be a really a nice feature. You know, the one thing I was initially worried about was the uh, the size of this anchor box. So I I had initially thought um, it looked a little small, but uh, but that was actually just a, a sort of an unfounded. Uh, worry because we've got 500 feet of of anchor rope in there the the 3 8 inch nylon and then also a pretty good size uh, anchor which which has just operated splendidly for the last year and you can see there's still still plenty of plenty of space so that's there's 300 uh, 500 feet of rope in there and still tons of space to uh you know to add more even if we needed to so so all in all yeah i'll put the bow here is uh this is really a nice, a nice space. Just to give you a sense of the, the walk through, I'll come from the bow all the way back to the stern. Um, but here's the sort of the top view. There's that Garmin radar I mentioned. See the sort of the bazooka rod holders, which I'll talk about in a minute. But you just make your way down. There is a ledge here, so I've definitely encountered that before so I would encourage anyone considering this boat to just be mindful the cabin itself is nice and tall but that that uh, ledge in particular uh, can be can be painful if you don't lean down uh, this door also nice nice height I can I can just walk under that without having to, to lean down 
and uh, and then sort of here we are on the fishing platform, which I'll explain more in detail shortly. So one question I get a lot about this boat is uh, is how how roomy is the fishing platform? So is there enough space to uh, you know to fish comfortably? Does it feel like you're cramped? Those types of questions, you know, and after. After a whole season of this, um, fishing on this boat, I would say this is very roomy. Uh, for a 21-foot boat, this fishing platform is is generous. Uh, I think one of the key key reasons why is actually because of the, the gunnels. So we've got these really these wide gunnels, which provides just extra stability and just a little extra room. So like folks can kind of lean against or, or even sit on these gunnels, which, which really just extends the... The platform overall a really really nice wide extended transom with that fish box which I'll show you in a second but basically it just gives you almost like an extra foot foot and a half around the whole platform so I mean you know if if we're doing some halibut fishing uh, if, if four people are fishing from this platform I just send one to each corner so like one there one there we close that door and so one back there and then one right here by the by the rear helm. Um, obviously, if two people are fishing, it'd be just just super easy. One out of one out of each side. You can also send um, one or two up to the bow if um, if the weather permits. And then when you're trolling, of course, um, you know it just depends on kind of the local regulations about how many how many lines you can have in. But you know between sort of double stack and downriggers and some additional rod holders that you can apply to those rails you can fish a lot of rods here if uh if, if you're really if you're really uh looking to do that and then there's still still plenty of room to you know for folks to stand and then if it's not um if it's a nice day you can actually you can just leave that open um so if if, if folks are looking for even more room or they just want to kind of sit in here and uh and just sort of you know observe the the process, so to speak, you've got these nice clear windows, so you can easily sit in here and watch your rod um, in a holder or something like that, or, or if you're salmon trolling and you're just, you know, looking to take a break, if you're tired of standing at the rear helm, uh, you could come come in here. If it's pouring down raining, as an example, you could come in here. Um, the rear, rear helm there is, uh, the kicker is tied into the exact same uh, alignment as as the main motor, so you can basically you know, steer from that helm, um, and, and then control the control the kicker as well if 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 you choose to do that. So let's talk uh, fish storage. The um, we do some serious halibut fishing here around Juneau, Alaska. So one of my considerations, uh, I was initially a little hesitant about the fish box. I was wondering if this would be large enough. The in-floor fish box. In-floor fish boxes are extremely useful uh, for halibut. You know they're kind of big, messy fish, and when you get one on board, you need to not only quickly wrangle it but also uh, bleed it, which is can be a messy process. And it's very nice to have the in-floor storage to just be able to kind of slide them right in uh, once that melee is over, as opposed to having to you know lift everything up into the into the transom fish box. This actually, um, like I said, from a space standpoint. I looked at it initially and I was thinking, oh my gosh, w what are we going to do if we catch a big one? Uh, it might not fit. Uh, in fact, this has fit um, a lot of really nice fish. You know, fish in the like 80, 90 pound range, you're able to slide those right in there. I'd say anything that starts getting into that low barn door range, you know, that like 100, 130, that's where they won't uh, fit entirely just based on their um, their width and also their length. But that's okay. Like if you're catching those barn doors and if you're choosing to harvest them on an exception basis, then just keep those on the deck. But otherwise, uh, everything you're going to catch halibut wise, you know, under that hundred pound range, plus of course the mixed bag of like rockfish, cod, um, you know, sort of whatever else you, you happen to be catching, you can just, just toss those in there easily. And I love the fact that there's a macerator here. So up there, you have the uh, a macerator pump, which means that you have the, the option to, to set this fish box to drain right into the back of the boat. That's the sort of the default. Um, 
which makes sense because if it's pouring down raining you want that water to just kind of drain to the back of the boat and then it'll hit the automatic bilge and it'll get out of there but if you're putting fish in here you can imagine the goo that's going to build up as you start to bleed fish in there and um just some of the you know the mess associated with that you don't want that in the back of your boat you don't want that having to grind through your bilge make everything nasty and smelly uh, so what you can do is is there's a uh, a knob that I'll show you in a second that sits behind those little doors that'll actually just change it to the to the macerator setting which means that it's not going to drain into the back of the boat it means that it's going to drain into this uh this pump and actually you can use that pump to just pump out all of the gunk so rather than that having to go into your boat it'll actually pump out the side of the boat so all that you know fish junk so to speak will just get kind of deposited right back into the water and you don't have to deal with it uh, in your bilge pump. Of course, the other feature for fish storage would be this, this transom fish box, which is, is a really generous size. Um, I've been really impressed. Even fishing like the salmon derby last year, I mean, we were really stacking some nice, some nice cohos and kings and, uh, you know, you could fit tons and tons of fish in here. Um, one thing that we actually like, it's so wide that you can put a small cooler like this. Um, this is just what we use as a bait cooler. Many people use a cooler this size as a bait cooler. Uh, it's actually super convenient to just toss that in there if you're halibut fishing. I mean, we're actually going to be halibut fishing here shortly. But you can see, you just toss your bait cooler in there. Get it, gets it nice and out of the way. Uh, we keep the spray down there as well. So we're really only using this if we're, um, if we're, if we're salmon trolling. The salmon will go in here, um, but the halibut will go in the in-floor fish box. Again, you see the drain. There's a plug there. So this drains right out the, uh, the side of the boat. Speaking of that hose, that connects over here to the washdown pump. So that's really nice to have a, a washdown of course it's salt water it's pulling the water from the ocean and then sort of pressurizing it it's like a mini pressure washer but if you do end up sort of skunking the the deck you know if you get a big halibut or um if you track some some gunk into the boat from the dock uh it's nice you can just kind of spray it down you, you know you spray it and it'll it'll the water will just run right to these these back holes here which will go into the back of the boat which will um which will be evacuated by the bilge pump the bilge pump is sort of fully automatic, so it is hardwired into the battery. So even if the batteries are turned off, that bilge uh, will, will always uh, run on an active basis. So if there's water there, it'll, um, it'll turn on. If there's not water, it'll turn off. Yeah, you also have the ability up at the captain's helm to, to actually just force the bilge on. So if for some reason uh, the automatic wouldn't work or if there's some other reason why you'd want to have it on because you just know there's going to be a need for bilging uh, you can force it on as well but um, but anyway that spray down is, uh, is super useful um, just always being able to give a, a nice spray down and not have to have you know gunk on the boat either the deck of the boat or even up here so as you're cutting you know cutting your bait you know you don't have to don't always have to have you know scales and goo around giving it a quick spray every now and then is uh, is a nice feature Speaking of cutting bait, um, you know, the top of this transom fish box does serve as a cutting board as well. Um, you know, something we like to do is actually use uh, some shop wipes. So like some really heavy duty paper towels, basically. We lay those down and then we'll, we'll lay out our, you know, herring or, or salmon belly or octopus or whatever we're, squid, whatever we're using for bait. Um, just to try to keep this nice. I mean, if, if you use it as a straight cutting board, Obviously, it'll look like a really well-worn cutting board uh, in no time at all. So, um, of course, we, you know, we do have some, some cuts in there because when you're cutting through paper towels, it doesn't mean nothing will get through. But, but it is kind of nice to, to just keep this in a little bit uh, nicer working order so that we don't have to replace that every year. So you can never have too much rod storage. Um, this boat came standard with the, the side rod holders. See, there's three on this side right there. We actually like putting the net uh, in there. When we're traveling, when we're fishing, like trolling for salmon, we open that net up and we put it right over the right over the top, so that it's actually real easy to grab. Um, you know, three 
rod holders over here. Again, those were the ones that came came standard, but we decided to add, you know, eight of the rocket launchers. You know, you can see the salmon setups there and a couple of some halibut setups there. Uh, those rocket launchers are super, super helpful. Just gets everything up out of the way. Um, just a little bit of, little bit of uh, extra storage so that you don't have, um, you know, that, that type of gear sitting around the fishing deck. The extent to which you can keep that fishing deck as, uh, as gear free as possible, uh, the better off you'll be. So, you know, we, we opted for those, those bazooka rod holders and, and glad we did. I would do that again in a heartbeat. So here's the rear helm. Um, as I mentioned before, this is super useful, uh, especially if you're trolling for salmon or maybe you're back trolling for, for halibut. Um, you know, you can see we have that second chart plotter unit up there, which is really, really a nice feature. And then as you come over, you can see the, uh, the throttle for the kicker. So if we wanted to put the kicker down, we'd toss it down get the key started up and we'd be good to go. And again, this steering column is tied into uh, to that one as well. So you're able to, to leave the, the main down, that 225. I'll just give them both a turn and it will turn, uh, turn both of them, which is, is a really nice feature. It gives you a lot of stability, um, when, when, especially when you're trolling for, for salmon. Sometimes up here in Juneau, you get a lot of extreme tides and currents going on and so if you just had that 9.9 down in the water uh, you might struggle for boat control but that 225 down there acting as a rudder really does help stabilize it and then of course that 9.9 has plenty of power to propel this boat not just for trolling but but really a nice safety mechanism as well uh, if you would ever if your main motor would ever go down that 9.9 does have a capability to get um, you know, to get this 21 foot boat a fair distance um, safely. Just to give you a sense of the storage on the back fishing deck here, you know, you've got a nice rail in the gunnel that provides ample storage. Another rail over here. And then you've got this uh, nice box, a lockable box here. For, uh, for even more storage. We usually keep different types of like ha halibut scents and things that are a little bit kind of messy and smelly. We'd prefer to keep those out here, not have to skunk up the cabin with them. Hey, one more often overlooked feature is this uh, foot rail. So if you can see, there's a little ledge here. So if you're wearing uh, boots, I've got these steel-toed extra tufts. You can actually toss your foot right in there, and then if it's real wavy or if you're fighting a, a halibut, that actually provides a lot of leverage. So as you're standing up here, you know, doing your fishing or, or whatever, you need to get your balance, that can make all the difference in the world. Just a, just a nice feature specifically designed for fishermen. And I've pulled these covers off just so you can see the, uh, the battery storage here, so got the batteries, the fuel filters, bilge, and then also that, that dial that I referenced earlier. So this is coming right from the fish box. That's that macerator pump. So right now that's pouring into the back of the boat, but if we had some fish in there, we would turn that, send it to the macerator and get all that fish box gunk uh, out of there, pump it right out. Yeah, one of the reasons this 21-footer uh, fish is, I think, much larger than a 21-foot boat is is because of this extended transom. Uh, that, that might not seem like a big deal, but right off the back here, I mean, you've got probably two, three feet, and then, you know, and then the engine brackets, you know, sort of that offshore mount, which is much different than if if that outboard was sitting right here at the edge of the... Uh, of the fish platform. You know, just imagine that outboard sitting here, uh, that would really encroach on your fishing space. So I think another reason why it's such a spacious platform is because it really gets all the, you know, all the hardware back here, the, the engines out away from the, from the fishing space, a really, really a nice feature. And also if, 
you know, if you're having an epic battle with a marquee salmon, um, you're able to hop out here onto the transom and, um, and do some net work or perhaps some harpooning if you've got a halibut. Um, so it does offer a little bit of extra flexibility too to have this platform. Of course, a, a safety ladder there as well. You know, you're not, not doing a lot of swimming up here in, in Alaska, but if, um, if for some reason someone were to fall out of the boat, um, it is really important always to have that safety ladder to be able to, you know, safely get, um, get back onto the vessel. Downriggers. This is uh, another source of uh, much debate. So there's probably a lot of opinions out there about what downriggers to use. Um, you know, for, for me, the decision was, uh, was kind of simple. Uh, there, there were, there was a lot of guidance out there saying, go for the, the basic downrigger, the most standard downrigger that has just the very basic functionality, uh, just goes up and down, tells you how deep it is, etc. Uh, keep it simple. That was one paradigm. Uh, the other one was, you know, there's some, some emerging technology that, that, that has some new features that aims to sort of change the game of, of trolling. Uh, I opted for, for the latter, you know, so I, we've got these Canon um, Digitrol uh, tournament series downriggers. So these, these Digitrol 10s, and I've been really, really, really happy with, uh, you know, with the results. So, you know, you can see throughout the Salmon Derby and actually plenty of other salmon trolling videos from last year, uh, there were a lot of a lot of good good catches on these on these downriggers. Some of the features that I just absolutely love. I mean, the auto up is great because <clears throat> once you get a fish on, it'll just you know you hit auto up, and before you know it, your uh, your downrigger ball will be right back up to the surface. It does have a surface balancing; it, they call it a water zero, so that your your downrigger ball doesn't fly up out of the water, potentially, um, you know, hitting your boat if, if you're in waves. Sometimes we are trolling out there in some chop. And so if, if you pull that downrigger ball up over the water, there's a pretty good chance it's going to crush the side of your boat. So that the fact that you can zero it out at the water level, so it'll never pull it up above the water level is, uh, is really a nice feature. These downriggers also have a cycling feature. So I can sort of have them go up and down across depth ranges. You know, f for ease of use, I find going um, cycling just a couple of feet actually can be uh, useful. That way you don't have to sit there and constantly monitor the, the rod to, to let more line out or, or kind of reel it up. But even within like a three, uh, you know, three foot, four foot window going up and down, it provides a little bit of differentiation on whatever interval you want. So if you want to fish at, you know, 40 feet, um, and then 30 seconds later, you want to bring it up three feet. 30 seconds later, you want to put it down three feet. Uh, it gives you that flexibility to run that cycle. And then you just sort of set it and forget it. And, and, and you know, it'll just follow the, the, the track for you. Both of these downriggers are, are networked. So they're sort of connected to each other. Um, and they, they do have their own transducer. So there is a, a Canon transducer on this boat and also and also a Garmin one. This is actually a really helpful feature. So I know some folks down like in the Great Lakes, they really appreciate the feature because it allows them to troll uh, to bottom track. So you can track, you can set these to track like five feet off the bottom or three feet off the bottom. I know there are some places where salmon hold very close to the bottom. And so the ability to get, you know, within a few feet of the bottom can be just a make or break uh, difference in success. Uh, for me though, like there are some spots where we're trolling, especially for, for kings in some of the terminal fishery areas around here, uh, where we do find ourselves up into some shallow coves, uh, you know, we'll be in, in 30 or even as shallow as 20 feet of water. Um, so the fact that I can be standing right here, um, and then get a depth reading and be able to quickly adjust just real time, be able to move this to exactly where it needs to be. Uh, is is super super helpful. You know some of these sharp ledges, drop offs, etc. Um, it, it would be a pain in the butt if I was having to stand here, and then go all the way back up to here, and then all the way back. Essentially, you know, every five seconds the whole time we were fishing 
to understand exactly what the depth range was because there are some areas that have such significant depth changes and those depth changes do correlate to uh, to where the fish hold so if you're able to really understand that and tune in uh, you know you'll catch more fish and so the fact that I can quickly see um, you know the sort of the bottom depth on this unit as well that unit also uh, I do think it does provide a little bit of a competitive advantage so big picture on these downriggers, again, um, you know, there's some prefer to just keep it simple with some basic setups. Uh, I totally respect and appreciate that. You know, a lot of charter guys run some pretty basic ones as well. Uh, I've seen reviews stating that, you know, one of the decision criteria for someone selecting a keep it simple model was uh, it held a beer can better than the other brand. So there's a lot of different uh, variables out there. You know, but for me, I was really interested in taking a look at what is what's the latest technology now and how can I better understand that because in the next uh, you know five or ten years this stuff's going to evolve rapidly and so to really start to understand you know where this technology is headed I thought gave me a better chance of um, of landing in a even more successful spot you know a decade or two from now uh, being able to really leverage the the latest and greatest really kind of you know, pass the puck to where the, the skater is uh, going as opposed to where they are now. So I just pulled the downrigger off and and put up this rod holder. This is where we landed um, from a fishing rod holder standpoint. Just these Scotty uh, rod holders with a, with a rail mount. This is useful um, on two dimensions. One, if you're trying to add a sort of an extra salmon rod um, while trolling. So you can you can either double stack a uh, a downrigger, so you could put two rods on the same downrigger, uh, or you can run one one rod down on the downrigger and then put in something like this and uh, and then send a rod out fishing a little bit shallower, you know, perhaps trolling a a plug or a spoon or something like that. Uh, so that's useful for salmon trolling, but also for halibut. Uh, if you set your drag correctly, you can toss a halibut rod in these rod holders as well. So that can be a really nice feature. Um, sometimes folks don't want to hold the halibut rod the whole time. Um, even when you're jigging, uh, which is a blast, sometimes if, if there's enough chop, uh, so if there's some waves, the waves will actually do some jigging for you. So sometimes you could just take a little break, toss the, uh, the halibut rod in that holder, you know, and the boat's moving up and down by a foot or two. Uh, so it's essentially just jigging it right off the bottom for you. It's doing the work. So it's really nice to have those, uh, you know, rod holders, the ability to just toss it in the holder. Of course, set your drag when you do that if you're halibut fishing. Make sure you're either using a reel with a bait runner feature, or um, if not, make sure your drag set loose enough that if you do get railroaded by a big halibut, uh, it's not going not gonna to pull the, the holder out. It's not going to break your rod it's not going to pull your rod out all kinds of bad things can happen so uh, the drag is your friend uh, with halibut and you want to make sure you you set it loose enough if you are um, putting it in a rod holder hey one more cool feature is this led deck light so you can see right here it actually lights up the entire entire deck super powerful not that we fish at night much but it's still Still nice to have um, if it's real dark, foggy, or or even as just a safety light if we are overnighting. Um, and then there's also these these courtesy lights in for the interior, which uh, we do use. So again, if you got that bed out and you're spending a night out on the water, um, it's nice to have some some interior lights. So just to wrap this up, you know, overall, if I was asked, you know, would I buy the same boat again, having sort of fished in it for for a season already? or would I recommend, would recommend it to a friend? I would say the answer is yes and yes. You know, this is, this is just an awesome fishing boat, just through and through. You know, it's a, a really stable fishing platform. Again, that, having that extra power on the back really makes a nice difference. These wide gunnels, you know, you feel very safe. You know, it, it just, it slays two to three footers with ease. You know, and even if you do end up in those four to six footers, uh, it navigates them safely, which I think is is just really really important. Um, you know, overall, it's just a, an awesome awesome fishing boat. You know, it's not the it's not the Cadillac or the Rolls Royce. So there are there are higher end boats that have you know some other features like you'll have like the full bathroom or like mahogany wood finishes things like that. Um, but this is a purpose fit fishing boat. You know, it really as you're fishing in it, as you're you know 
going trip by trip, a whole season in it. You can really tell, like it's it's been uh, designed by fishermen for fishermen, and uh, and it definitely it definitely feels that way. And I know it catches a ton of fish, some big halibut, big salmon. Uh, I'm just getting kicked off here for the 2020 season, and I can't wait to. Uh, to spend not only this season but many other seasons on the water with this uh, with this awesome vessel. So if you guys have any um, any questions or you know things I didn't answer, feel free to um, to comment on them and I'll, I'll I'll respond to you. Feel free to feel free to reach out. Otherwise, I hope this was helpful. Uh, if you're looking to buy a boat uh, and you're considering this one, I would say pull the trigger. Um, if it's somewhere in the future, I'd say uh, definitely keep it on the bucket list and, and make it happen because this is an awesome fishing vessel and it'll lead to some, some great memories. Take care everyone. Bye for now.